Welcome to Eternal Journey, the podcast. Greetings to all my knights and paddle ones out there. You are listening to Eternal Journey, the podcast that talks about all things eternal with a focus on limited play. I'm your host, Jedi, and this is episode 83 of the podcast where we are going to be doing our Awakening Campaign review. That is right. Tire Wolf blessed us with another campaign, this one having the storyline in it for you to participate in, learn some more lore, and then get some sweet cards. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing, breaking them down for Constructed, because sadly, we won't be able to draft them. I mean, we kind of did, but we'll get into that later. But first things first, I want to let you know about my good friends that are always somehow okay being on the line with me every week. Thank God, dealing with some natural disasters. Coming up first is John Holio. How are you doing, friend? I'm all right, uh, all things considered. Uh, how are you guys doing? Doing a lot better than you are, apparently, but I'm glad you're weathering the storm, friend. We're happy to have you. See, look at that. Out of all the things you could be doing to help him survive, he's recording a podcast about a digital card game. <laughs> we call that commitment. Yes. Speaking of someone that is extremely committed, another avid drafter that is probably going to be grueling through today's episode, but we're still going to get something out of him, is Alex. What's up, buddy? What is up? How's it going, my friends? Alex. <laughs> And of course, it's Darth Herman too. For those of you that uh, come across him on Ladder, definitely show some love. They appreciate hearing how much you guys are enjoying the podcast as much as I do. Which, man, I got to say, dude, I feel like every week more and more people learn. I think I've had three people reach out to me this week saying that uh, they've gone up a rank in, in draft because of the show. So you guys are doing a great job, man. Keep it up. Don't let me uh, wear you guys out. All right. But we actually brought a third or fourth person on the show fourth person on the show third friend something like that i don't know anywho i'm gonna leave all that in anywho member <laughs> of team eternal journey top player in both formats that's right this guy gets top 10 consistently month after month in both expedition and in throne uh he does amazing things with the decks he shares with the team i gotta admit i cannot play them to the extent or expertise <laughs> that he does normally he shows up he's like hey man this deck went 18 and 2 so i think it's all right you can try it and i come back with like yeah i went 9 and 11 but i still think it's good but anywho testament to his play skill i want to welcome on the show m sorbet how you doing buddy i'm doing all right uh glad glad to be on the show we are happy to have you. Like I said, he is a phenomenal brewer, consistently throwing up good numbers. So we figured we'll bring him on the show to help us break down these new and great constructed cards. But first things first, let's get some announcements out of the way. You can catch us streaming live every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday at twitch.tv slash Jedi underscore EJ, where you can catch me punting live on screen and catch John and Alex in the chat calling out every single one of my punts and face palming. If you can't catch us live, you can catch the video version of this podcast as well as other draft videos and tutorials for our beginner players on YouTube. Just search up Eternal Journey and there you have it. And then finally, it leads us to our shout outs section, just where we give back to the community that gives so much to us. Let's get some love out there. First off, our returning contributors, Chastity Weaver, Extinction, and Mercurial Blow. These people are absolutely amazing. Just giving out so many gift subs and donating so many bits to the cause. They literally keep the lights on in this place. Well, I guess maybe not where John's at, but they are on this side. So for all intents and purposes, we do appreciate what they do. So thank you guys so much. Speaking of Mercurial Blue, he is getting extremely close to getting his custom card button pushed for the direwolf option so if you guys see him streaming eternal definitely jump in his stream give him some lurk so he can accumulate the influence to get his own custom card speaking of custom cards i want to give a shout out to n roush one uh, no strangers to the show n roush has successfully completed the journey and see 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 what i did there journey <laughs> eternal eh, eh. <laughs> i know i know i i, I I'll, I'll see myself out Anywho, uh, just I didn't get it. it. Just kidding. M muted. <laughs> Anywho, I'll edit that out. Um, uh, 
So yeah, we're gonna have the downhill snowball is gonna be added to the eternal card pool eventually. So congratulations to Enrosh one. And then finally, I want to give a shout out to the misplay, uh, our sister podcast, brother podcast, cousin podcast. I don't know how this works in podcast world, but anywho, give them a shout out because I somehow managed to successfully fool everyone in the community to think that I am the most skilled drafter in the in this podcast because of the simple fact that they did a recent draft of the players that were competing in the most recent draft championship that we talked about in previous episodes. And guess what? I was the only one drafted out of the three of us. So booyah. That's right. Everyone thinks I'm the good one. <laughs> Little do they know I'm the worst one. Actually. Wait, what? I haven't even, they did a draft of players and I wasn't even picked. Yeah. I totally thought you got, I thought I wasn't going to get picked and you guys were going to get picked, but I guess they didn't. They were like reverse trolling you. If, if it makes you feel any better, Parmley is the one that picked me. So the actual like two good play people on their podcast. No, I'm not going to do that to him. This was for the draft championship. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They I mean, were, to they... be fair, you're basically the only one of us that competed, so I think that's a good <laughs> good choice. <laughs> fair, but you know what's funny? While I'm saying this, I'm totally going to leave this in. I managed to punt anyways because I'm totally, my my information's incorrect. I just realized that <laughs> Gato Sujo actually picked M Sorbet because he was like, well, he's always... What? Left. Yeah. He literally, I'm, so, I'm so bad at drafting. <laughs> <laughs> it's no but apparently you got picked over me so great i i lose again somehow but oh god i just realized that i totally didn't invite you on the show like i put that in the show notes to bring that up and then later on i invited you on the show i didn't even put two and two together until i just <laughs> saw it so yeah got to sujo totally i was i was um i was parmley's third pick yeah I, all right i think i was his third pick because they did um a snake so it's like one everyone gets one and then the last person goes last and then first for the next round um so you know the usuals hats on laps kasedrith kalibovich they all got picked highly uh, i think i was parmley's third round pick and then i think you were gato sujo's third round pick as well either third or fourth um well yeah he was he was like well i always see m sorbet on the top of all the leaderboards so i think he's good i'm just gonna pick him <laughs> so yeah actually i lose again <laughs> never mind I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad somebody had some confidence in my draft skills because that would make one of us i mean you just don't draft <laughs> enough right the draft no, you I, have I, I don't you... I sh- I've, like i've i've um the first two months um that i started playing again i hit masters and draft but it's just I don't know. It's not as exciting for me. Why do we have you on the show? No, I'm not <laughs> it's fine. And it's fine. like, I did this one draft, got seven wins. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, you should. Oh my, you should have seen my performance in the draft championship. It was ooh, hot garbage. I mean, you can legitimately see mine on YouTube and just see the smoking dumpster fire that mine was. But that's all, all good. Right. <laughs> and so Ray's just chilling. Like, yeah, I haven't seen double digits in my ranks since I started playing. <laughs> all right so that does it for our announcements so once again shout out to the misplay podcast for that and somehow still trolling me even without i don't even think they knew you were on the team too you were, it was just completely random and they still managed to troll me so that's great all right all right so with that let's go ahead and dive into our pack one pick one which m sorbet since obviously you don't listen to the podcast and now you don't even draft we're gonna throw <laughs> a pack one at you and you're gonna tell us what you would pick so ha all right, well... Um, uh, nah, 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 nah. We got listeners, not just viewers, so I have to explain all the cards. Settle down there, yeah. Tiger. Sure, sure. He's, like, trying to rip it off like a Band-Aid. He's like, I just want to get this over with and talk constructed. <laughs> Can we talk about constructed? <laughs> I want to build and brew. All right, guys, so our pack one pick one is brought to us by John Holio, and this is... We have Dark Fire, five cost, five red, red, slow spell, deal damage to an enemy equal to the highest attack among your unit. If you have double shadow, dark fire has life steal. Forget fast spell one at a time. Revenge silence an enemy unit. Sand tornado a two three elemental for three time ambush flying on the enemy turn. Spellbound ursine a three three bear for five primal primal overwhelm and imbue. And let me just say I drafted a premium version of this today and it is absolutely gorgeous. Disappear the fast spell for six. Quad time, put a unit on the bottom of its owner's deck. Slag Fury Berserker is the 1-1 one, one Oni for 3 fire with Berserk and Imbue. Audacious Ruse is the 
two and a green fast spell enemy units get minus attack this turn equal to your justice influence and a blur haze worm is the one one worm for four time time imbue ultimate when you play a card on the enemy turn draw two cards at the uncommon slot we have saber of progress this is the plus three plus three relic weapon for six green green summon play a random sigil of from your deck depleted for every double time you have unbreakable tradition is the fast spell for five green green double a unit's attack and health permanently gain either double time or double primal and then finally to round out the uncommons we have spirit weaver the one three mage for two shadow your units with five attack or more have lifesteal summon plunder all right Starting off with you, M Bay, what are you looking at taking here, my friend? Oh, um, I, I feel like this is kind of an underwhelming pack. Um, pretty much all across the board. Uh, and so I don't know. I'm I'm generally just tempted to take the uh, the rare. Um, I, I don't think an eye is like amazing in draft because because the the age just just matters a little bit less, but. Um, I don't know. It just feels like a solid enough card. All right, fair enough. And What's... since you spoiled it, Ania or Naya is the. That sounds so much better. I don't know why I say Ania. Naya sounds so much better. <laughs> why didn't anyone correct me on that? Anywho, is a three-two gunslinger for two triple justice and single primal. She has Aegis. You can't lose Aegis while Anaya has Aegis and summon. You gain Aegis and Aegis. All right. All right, cool. So you were on Anaya. Fair enough. Uh, this is John's pack, so let's send it over to you, Alex. What are you looking at taking in this pack? I mean, M. Sorbet said it. It's a pretty underwhelming pack overall, I think. Um, none of the commons really stand out. It's something I'd be happy to first pick. Um, the pick for me is in between the Unbreakable Tradition and the Spirit Weaver. It's a shiny Spirit Weaver, which looks very nice. Um but I think I would lean towards the Justice card because I like Justice better. It's just a deeper color. And uh, you don't really need to build around the Unbreakable Tradition. You just kind of just do it to any unit and all of a sudden it's huge. So I would pick the Unbreakable Tradition. Okay. Sending over to you, John. Uh, yeah, it's also between Spirit Weaver and Unbreakable Tradition for me. Um, like... Anaya in draft is basically just like a, a hard to cast worse version of like a uh, chain whip bludgeoner, which is like a justice common in the format for two. Um, it like hits harder and, and um, you know, it's just much easier to play. Um, there's not a ton of weapons, you know, to, to, to make use of the Aegis and all that. Um, it's fine with imbue and like, I mean, it's, it's whatever, like I'm just not excited for the rare at all here. Um, so it's definitely between those two uncommons for me. And I'm with Alex. I think I, I would just take the tradition because it's justice. And it's it's surprisingly difficult to actually put together a good, like, a deck that really makes use of Spirit Weaver. Um, <laughs> I mean, picking it first does make that a little easier. Like, So it is actually pretty close. Um, and that'll make any Shadow deck regardless, just because it's plunder and a easy to cast two drop. But I, I still favor the uh, unbreakable tradition here it's just a little bit more powerful and yeah, love justice in the format yep what do you think that i see yeah, i actually like this pack i think there's a ton of cards in here that i'm perfectly fine I having like in my deck too. like i like disappear i like blur haze worm i like ursine tornado and dark fire i think blur haze worm disappear and ursine are higher than tornado and dark fire as far as picks but yeah obviously spirit weaver and tradition blow out everything else for me and my natural instinct is to go with you guys and just windmill slam unbreakable tradition because it's a combat trick it's a removal spell it wins games but i think and i'm not sure here's the thing i'm not sure because i feel like i draft huru so much that i actively try not to draft huru or, or justice i could be wrong like you know because i try to be entertaining when i stream and sometimes that gets clouded but the thing is for me is i think I think overall tradition does a lot more things but spirit weaver is a great card it has plunder which already makes it go up and 
it's a good first pick because it's easy to play. It's a two drop. It's a single influence. It goes in your deck as plunder. So I think here in this pack, I would begrudgingly take Spirit Weaver. But I'm I'm not sure. Like I'm 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 kind of caught. You know what I mean? Because the natural me is just like justice is open, slam justice. But then I'm like I don't know if that's always right or if that's just my preference. So just for the sake of being devil's advocate, I think the m most open and adult pick here is the Spirit Weaver. Um, and then you know you obviously get super rewarded if you see a Tentaclesis or not. But I mean Unbreakable Tradition goes good with everything, anyways. But yeah, I, I think. They're, they're a comparable pick. So I guess the winner here is the tr Unbreakable Tradition with two votes to 1-1. Two to 1-1. One, it's, one it's, one. it's really close. Yep. Nice. Fair enough. All right, guys. That's our pack one pick one. That was a good pack, actually. I kind of liked it. I like how everyone had like a different take on things for the most part, um, despite us drafting together all the time. But that is going to do it, which means we're going to go into our main topic, which is, once again, breaking down the... Uh, latest campaign which is called awakening that was brought to us by Daryl wolf digital uh this essentially without going too deep in the lore because honestly i don't know it uh i believe that vara was transported in, or no she was night it was sleep that's right i don't know if anything happened to cause this but she had a nightmare and in this nightmare world is where you know roland is a zombie and gives birth or creates all these zombie valkyries and all the good people are bad and bad people are good etc cetera, etc cetera. anywho all right, that's it. So what we're going to do here, we're going to do it a little bit different because I know people of all shapes, sizes, ages, flavors uh, enjoy brewing with different decks instead of potentially just being like this card's unplayable, don't use it. Uh, I will be playing devil's advocate and trying to find a way to make every card playable unless oh, obviously no. <laughs> unless right. John or M. Sir Bay are both like completely <laughs> off of a card that I'm going to be, or I'm sorry, I mean, on a card. Some of these cards are pretty bad. I know, I know, yeah. but but here, here here's the thing: like different strokes for different folks, right? Yeah, like, yeah. For you, sure. you guys are both looking at it from a competitive standpoint, but there's some people out here that will never step foot or click the entry button on a tournament. So they might just be perfectly fine playing cards that they're happy with. I mean, we hear about it all the time where you're like, "Yeah, this card's bad, but I really like playing with it." So I think. And don't get me wrong i'm not gonna like deep dive try to sway you guys over but if you guys are <laughs> sure. you know if there's a way it's like okay look you can play this card if you do this this and that you know what i mean like yeah, I, sure. I think it's worth it and that way we have a more positive spin on the show um if people want to get a more competitive breakdown i guarantee you that you know kamado and the backlash and friends of eternal are all doing their competitive breakdowns you know sure so and yeah. I mean, I, who who doesn't love hearing different opinions anyway? So yeah, for sure. And uh, the one thing I will say is that we we kind of hinted at, at the beginning of the show. The unfortunate thing is a lot of, we've done this the last couple of times we've broken down the campaign cards. It's super neat because there are cards that we're like, yeah, this is not going to see ladder play, but at the same time, if we were able to draft this card, would have been so good. Um, and we obviously know that they're never going to add them to the draft packs because they want you to spend some kind of money in the game. And so that's why there's the paywall for the campaign cards, but they did kind of meet us in the middle and they had a scion draft as the preview event for this, where you actually could draft the, the card. So that was super cool. So I do appreciate that. Shout out to Direwolf for putting that together at least. Okay. All right. So I'll tell you what John and M Sorbet, let's go ahead and start backwards this time, because I feel like every time we do the set reviews, we follow the order and so fire always gets the most detail and then shadow gets the least because we're tired by then so are you guys cool going backwards yeah it works with okay. me. all right sweet so we're we're gonna start off with the neutral card that has actually had quite a bit of discussion based on the kind of decks that want to play it and if this card is broken or not and we have a broken contract this is a undepleted power that's kind of cool so undepleted power it has fate if you have a unit in your void, play a 4-1 cell sword that can't block. So it's just a generic 4-1 unit that can't block. Essentially for free, you just have to have a unit in your void. Doesn't matter whether it died in combat beforehand, if you put it there by discarding or milling, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, all right, you're the guest, M. Sorbet. Go ahead and you start us off. What do you think of Broken Contract? Well, I think the card is pretty good. I, I personally have it played it in anything yet but i think um if you're playing an aggro deck that doesn't require a lot of influence um there's kind of no reason not to it's just free value yeah it's kind of interesting that you say that because we just are coming off of a set that was very influence re required and then some of the cards we're going to be talking about 
in this campaign are actually very influence intensive as well. So that's interesting that they kind of did something to appeal to multiple people, or do you think it's kind of a trap? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I think, uh, there are probably a couple decks, um, in either format that are fine playing this. Like, uh, if you're playing stone scar aggro or, or sky crag, I don't think you need like a ton of influence. Mm-hmm. So it feels, I don't know. It feels, it just feels free. So, do you think it's only aggro decks that want this card? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how useful a four-one that can't block is in uh, decks that aren't like trying to push damage. Okay, fair enough. And then, what what influence requirements do you think would be the the cap on whether you would run this or not? Like, if something requires four influence, for example, do you think you'd still run this as a deck, or is that too much influence requirement to run a card that doesn't give you influence? Um, I guess it depends on w- at what point in the game you need to cast that four influence card. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, if you're running, for example, any of these ascending cards, I feel like most of the decks that play those probably don't want to play this, um, especially because they they scale up as you gain more and more influence. Mm-hmm. But I feel like a lot of the um, a lot of the a lot of the aggro decks right now don't necessarily need that much influence as as far as i can recall so i think i don't know it feels like it's pretty well positioned okay uh, to see some play at least constructed wise yeah fair enough john what about you and then we'll send over to you alex as one of our aggro aficionados sure um i i agree with most of uh what emster base said i've done some brewing with this card um it's it, it really is like just a matter of like i think whether your deck uh you know is is uh, heavy on the influence like i think that's a that's basically the the main factor whether you play this or not um specifically like i don't think you want to play more than like say if you're like a dual faction deck i don't want something more than like you know something like machinations at the top right where it's a double double faction requirement at six like i think that's the ex- like in fact i've been playing broken contract in throne cultists and it's been great um because it's um you know it's an aggressive two drop and when you'd machinate it it comes back with with overwhelm even as like a five you know five attack thing it's sweet um it's easy to make it happen for free and that's a low influence requirement deck it's like the perfect deck and thrown for it um and i think even like some something similar in in expedition is good for it too like anything that's like a sack deck um but a lot of the ones we saw in the last like tournament scene were more heavy influence so I think if you do want this, you want to look more kind of like the older style, like FTS sack, where it's like maybe one pip of each kind of, you know, as opposed to a multiple of each, you know, going up the chain. So mm-hmm. it, it, it's, yeah, it, it, you know, influence seems free these days, but not free enough to just jam this. And in, in, uh, I think in most of the decks that people are playing, you yeah. can't just play this card yeah. because they are very heavy influence decks for the most part lately. I'm actually glad that you mentioned sack because that was the other thing I was gonna ask you is the if there was a deck that could potentially just want the body regardless of pushing damage or not. So thanks for answering that. Definitely. So, speaking of pushing damage, Alex. Um, this card's crap. All right, good talk. All right, <laughs> cool, excellent. Appreciate you, Alex. That was actually great. I like that. Okay, so moving right along to uh, Shadow now. We're going to be first card, once again, going in reverse order. So I'm sorry if I lost you guys. But Pull Into Nightmares. This is one of the cycle here where we're seeing a card, a spell from each faction. And then if you have influence from two other factions, certain things happen. So we're going to be breaking down these. Uh, So Pull Into Nightmares is a slow spell for five power and triple shadow. Play a unit with cost five or less from your void. It gets a plus one plus one permanently. Now, if you have five fire influence, the unit gets double damage. And if you have five time influence, pull into nightmares, i.e. the spell is a fast speed. Um, so I'm going to let you guys do some more breaking down. But honestly, I because of the heavy influence requirements, I really feel you should evaluate these cards more like either a how you want if you want the actual main effect of the card and or 
a two color deck so either run this in stone scar or run this in in uh xenon i don't think you're running this in a straight destruction deck but i could be wrong i don't know uh speaking of heavy influence requirements and greedy plays john let's start off with you for a pull into nightmares yeah um uh, I, I don't know like if you know if you're running like a five cost market like xenon maybe in throne you play this in your market or something i th i think uh <laughs> Like you could construct a, a deck where you care about either the double damage or the fast speed for sure, but I think it's like, you know, just generally for the effect of of uh, getting something from your void, and you know, I mean, you you do put it into play, so it's like on par with just the normal five cost, except that it it's restricted to a a, a unit that's five cost or less, right? So you know it's got its positives and its negatives compared to the the classic uh what is it grasping into shadows grasp yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so but this gives you like a five cost option for like an, an expedition deck right to do grasping stuff and then we also got another card we're gonna talk about in a minute like dr zytrum for example that also puts five cost cards in your void so like there's a little synergy there like i think there's some potential to brew with this um nothing really jumps out at me but um you know being like ambush style xenon or something you you might have the influence anyway you might you know have access to the five cost market anyway and then like giving something plus one plus one and and putting it in play at fast speed means you can ambush something with it so i think there's definitely some play here um it has some potential yeah i agree with you and that's what stands out to me about the card is the xenon mode of it where you get stuff at the end of your opponent's turn so they couldn't plan around it or in mid combat i like that i i find it a little hard i mean don't get me wrong there's gonna be some blowouts in stone scar with the double damage sure but it, you know and like you said i think initially when i looked at it i thought it was gonna be another version of grasp that kind of helped the fact to accommodate the new market rule but yeah the cost five or less a unit with cost five or left definitely stops that from happening. Um, so yeah, like I could see some application, right? Giving double damage and a plus one, plus one to a cha-cha could be a thing end of turn. But then, yeah, even if you're end of turn, like it's that's no longer stone scar. So it's, yeah, I just paying five. I don't know. I'm a I'm hundred percent sure. Uh, Sorbet, what do you think? I think this card's pretty bad. Um, <laughs> I, 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 probably, I probably wouldn't play it in anything. I could see, I could see an argument for, um, specifically the five cost market, um, just because I think there's in, in Xenon, there's not like that many amazing options. I mean, there's like the, the, the few options that are amazing that you always have in your five cost market. And then there's always like one or two spots that I'm just like, I'll just throw in whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, so I could see that, but other than that, like when I look at this card, I think, um, the only time I would want to play it is if you have all the influence requirements, but it, forcing all those requirements like it's just not worth it maybe once we get like a carve it like card and in, in some other faction groupings where it like powers out some high levels of influence you know yeah per perhaps but it's like just because it's only five cost or less it feels like you have to jump through a couple hoops like you have to have a powerful card in your yard and you're probably not putting this in in a like dedicated or in a deck that's like dedicated to putting cards in your uh in your void yeah like it screams out at me <laughs> that's kind of funny I, I i totally did not plan for that poem but i'm like it screams out to me to play it with scream but then now you're playing four colors which is with yeah. heavy influence so it's just a, it's like a mess so i think the card is gonna lead to some blowouts and i could see i wouldn't fault anyone for playing it but i definitely do think it, it's it's competing with some cards on efficiency i I, I very I find it very difficult to see this come into play in uh, Stone Scar. I, I see it more as Xenon thing just because of the potential removal spell aspect of it as well. Okay, let's go ahead and move on because we do have a lot to get through. Next up, we have Distracting Flashbang. This is a plus five, plus three weapon, so it goes on your unit for five power and double shadow. When the wielder hits enemy the enemy player, steal one of their relics with cost four or more. Uh, of note, as far as I'm assuming, they have to have the relic in play because you can't just take it from their hand. And I mean, immediately I was gonna say this thing is a little bit of counterplay to rats, but all their relics cost less. So this is really just to hose armory further or to take Grodov's burden. Because even the Linrai Codex, the primal, I mean, mm -hmm. 
it hits Pyre, it hits World Pyre, it hits Grodos Burden, it hits Linrise Codex, but I mean, two of those decks run face ages. So, I mean, I guess it has pseudo charge because you could put it on a unit that's already in play, but I mean, transpose is still very strong a thing in the form. I'm not I'm not sure. Like plus 5 plus 3 is pretty decent as well, but it's just a vanilla plus 5 plus 3. I think you're better off running combat tricks. I'm I'm not quite sure. Let's start off with you, Sorbe. Um so again, I think the only consideration for um constructed would be to put it in the five cost market and i don't i don't um particularly hate it there just because you you get your one one like you flash in your one one at the end of their turn so you know you're pretty much always going to have a target for the weapon um but it's just it's just a matter of whether or not you think it's better than confiscate um which most cases is probably not Mm -hmm. i mean it like you said it does make one of your mediocre units into a viable threat so there is that right i mean it's kind of the the idea behind burglar as as well where you're not just taking away their weapon you're you're gaining one yourself so it puts you up a card so there is that right because you're you're getting rid of and this is the same thing you are stealing it so you're you're not only you're kind of almost getting a a two for one i should say maybe a three you're actually getting a three for one technically right because you're you're taking yeah. you're getting a card out of their hand or away from their deck you're gaining a card and then they still have to have an answer to your threat that you just made so i don't yeah, know but i it's just a matter of like what relevant um relics that you can take with it um and i think the the big ones um would be which is why you would run relicate in your in your five cost market anyway would be like backbreaker and um world pyre and stuff like that um and with backbreaker it doesn't work because most of the time you're just going to destroy it yeah good point um when you're hitting with the weapon um and then world pyre like you said they're gonna have ages most of the time so feels kind of medium yeah you also probably don't even care that you're stealing it as opposed yeah. to just throwing it yeah yeah fair enough i mean it it's so niche it's definitely a market card at best for sure like i i, I can't imagine a deck wanting to run you know two three four of these or whatnot john do you have anything to add i'm just super not into it like <laughs> yeah <laughs> like and you don't want to nar- you know make your narrow market answer like i.e card that answers relics to be extra narrow like yeah especially when one of the one of the bigger banes lately has been a three cost relic which is trying to carve it anyway so no i'm i'm just i don't think i'm really looking to play this ever i don't you know yeah i'm really interested to see what in play testing made them add that little caveat you know what i mean because <laughs> you gotta assume the number wasn't just random for some reason they felt the need to make sure this thing doesn't hit every relic and i'm not quite sure why but okay yeah. sure it's, it's kind of weird because even if it didn't say cost more or more it probably still wouldn't see exactly. much play yeah it's still conditional but you, i could imagine a deck where it's like a, it's like your preference over burglarize when you're like playing all these like unblockable things or something because you're in shadow yeah. i mean i could i could imagine a deck you know maybe maybe it doesn't exist right now but <laughs> yeah like i love saying that right yeah like but that's how that's how you know card games are developed right they they put cards and campaigns early with future things in mind to go with them. So it's a fair thing to say half the time. <laughs> oh yeah. We've definitely seen like that. One of the cards we're going to talk about later is uh, an answer to one of the big, you know, boogeymans of, of the current meta that everyone complains about, but we digress. All right, moving on to the next one. This is actually a community card that was purchased slash created by fellow limited streamer Kalibovich. And this is Dr. Zytron. This is a 2-6 cultist for 4 shadow. Enemy damage can't be deadly. This includes enemy weapons, enemy relic weapons, and enemy units. Summon, play a unit with cost 5 or less from the enemy void. It gets charge and flying. Sacrifice it at the end of turn. So essentially this is roughly a uh, screen, uh, was it haunting scream on a stick? with obviously the slight modification that you have to steal it from your opponent's void, which, you know, may or may not be a thing with it being a four drop, but you can definitely accommodate the board state to facilitate that. And it, obviously, if you can really not only take a good unit from them, but if you could take something with a wicked summon effect, then that is extremely backbreaking. Strangers are coming back into the meta, so you could steal one of the strangers you killed earlier and then get that stranger's trigger as well as whatever strangers they still have on their board. 
Uh, there's all kinds of crazy shenanigans you could do with this. And uh, two six blocks a decent amount of things, especially now that deadly is being negated. Not a lot of deadly running around currently. Uh, we're looking at pretty much um, the alchemist and the reapers from Roland that I can think of off the top of my head. But uh, it still can be quite relevant. Like it's not relevant until it is, and then it's huge. So champ champion too. Oh yeah, yeah, thank you. Yes, champion. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Cha cha. Yep, champion of uh, chaos. All right, yeah. John, where are you at on Doctor Zydron? Uh, I'm not sure about him. Like I, the stat line is actually kind of okay. Like the the six health blocks. You know, it's it's fine for four drop stats. Um, I'm not sure when or where that you know enemy damage can't be dead deadly is like really that relevant. Like yeah, there's some deadly in the in the meta. Um you know, with like alchemist and things, but like, I, I don't think you're playing it just for that ever. Um, it's just like a kind of a nice upside on the card. Like maybe there's like a, some future deadly stuff that, uh, you know, I, I wonder if Caleb uh, pushed for that or if it's like Direwolf was like, we need to put this on a card, <laughs> you know, for some future <laughs> stuff to have a safety valve or what, you know, but um, you know, I don't, like they kind of, they, they messed with haunting scream, right. And balance patches a few, things uh, a few months ago and i never really found that much exciting stuff to do with it so like i'm i'm a little low on i guess dr z here um i i tried to find some places for him in some expedition decks and i don't know i'm just not seeing it like uh Sokka had a had a good idea um like comboing him with uh the site the junkyard um to maybe you know go for some some good value there where you steal some you know some real some really good unit and then uh, get it out of your um, void all upgraded with junkyard. So maybe there's something there. Um, I, I that one Scion draft I did, I had him in my in my deck there. And uh, I, the issue was I kept I really always wanted to play him on or near four to stabilize. Like he's a good body, and I never had a good target to to do the summon effect. You know, so it never played out good for me in the games where I played him. So. See, and I think that's actually still fine. Like, that's what yeah, gives him the versatility, kind of right? Obviously, you want to play him and get your value off the summon effect. But, I mean, a 2-6 is pretty interesting because it blocks. It blocks. I mean, I guess it doesn't block Alheed, though. We'll talk about it in a little bit because I'll have Decay by that point. But it blocks uh, Sandstorm Titan. Um, it blocks the... Uh, all the, the Jack. It blocks Milos. So it, I mean, it can block Cha Cha. That's impressive. <laughs> uh, I mean, as long as it doesn't have deadly. Oh yeah, that's right. It loses it. Yeah, oh, there yep, you go. Yep. Yeah, Hard. yeah, yeah. Exactly. So yeah, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, like sometimes just playing this guy on four is pretty legit. The uh, flip side too is that I mean, you could steal. There's some relevant stuff to steal in this format right now. You could steal the. Uh, uh blight moth you can steal opponents milos and Jax. you can steal the uh what's the valkyrie the three three that deals menace there you go menace skirt what is um the three three that deals damage to the face oh, oh, oh sil silver blade menace yes there you go silver blade that's a huge one right if your opponent used yeah. it on you chances are it's probably gonna be good against them as well so i i, th I think this card has modial it it's one of those things where each part isn't that strong, but the culmination of all those things makes it pretty strong. So I, I don't know. I like this guy. I think he's he's definitely he going to be a player. Yeah, I think um, I think this is like a largely meta dependent card. Um, and I would say uh, how the meta is unfolding right now, it seems pretty good because um, you have a lot of good targets in the mono primal um, sort of decks. Like if you get uh, the the stranger, you get to you get a stun and you get a free three three. Uh, with flying, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think I think they probably had to nerf um, Helio specifically um, when also printing this card because um, if it if it could also hit Helio, this this card would kind of be insane. Yeah. Oh, speaking of that, this card hit, does hit Oobsat. It hits Oobsat. Yes. It, so I think there's a lot of good targets for it right now. But if if the meta were to shift into a place where it was like a lot of primal control decks that are just super unit light, then it becomes kind of terrible. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really it's really meta dependent. But as long as there's like aggro decks and then mid range decks that have good targets for it to hit, then this will this will probably see some play. 
All right, and now our final shadow card, but that is actually the first of the other cycle that's in this is the Ascending. So much like what John spoke about earlier, each faction has a hero that is essentially ascending. And what you're going to see here, it is a two drop that will gain a benefit with four influence, gain a benefit with six influence, and then finally gain a, a third benefit at eight influence of their respective faction so first one we have akantha ascending she is a 2-1 elf dragon for two shadow shadow at four influence when akantha attacks play a 2-1 dark elf at six influence she gets a plus two plus two in flying making becoming a 4-3 flyer that when she attacks she makes a 2-1 and then finally at eight influence when akantha hits the enemy player they sacrifice a unit uh, this card overperformed for me in the scion draft i have not tried her and constructed yet uh, i did go up against a mono shadow deck that was running her and it did all right but i was kind of already losing that game so it was a, felt a little win more ish but uh yeah don't take i mean there's some serious relevance here if anyone remembers you know baby akaro that's making a resurgence in the meta right now a uh, four three flyer for two can be quite powerful if left unchecked and making a free chump blocker or another sack effect then obviously your opponent does get to choose when you attack but if if you're going up against a mid-range deck or you've managed to take out some of their other cards and you hit them eventually that that sack a unit thing is going to start to become a major issue so i think the potential here is definitely high and then obviously the ground being extremely easy where you play it and then it dies to uh, vara's favor or whatever uh, i think we started with sorbet so starting off with you john yeah, Kanta is just really solid, right? Like, uh, she's very, very, like, worthless until you have that six <laughs> shadow threshold. But, you know, even on four, like, she's really not attacking into anything, right? And making a 2-1, like, you're never doing that until she's got the evasion and the stats going. Um, but I think at that point, she's very, very good and, and uh, you know, so efficient at just two cost. Um, so I think it's like a basically an auto include if you're a heavy shadow deck i think well also um, sorry go ahead. Go ahead. no uh, i'm sorry well you know you're in shadow you're gonna have to follow you're gonna have suffocate you're gonna have annihilate you're gonna have ways of getting in damage or getting blockers out of the way early so yeah but i don't think like just getting it you know like a 2-1 elf is not very exciting it, like now if you're playing a like an elves deck like if you're doing this in like thrown elves or something I think it, it goes up in, in value across the board, you know, with the elf synergies, but I don't really think that's supported right now in Expedition. So, I, but I, I do think you still just want to play this as a, a mm -hmm. very efficient mono, mono shadow unit. Yeah. I mean, I can't think of too many two drops in shadow right now that clearly are better than Akantha, like obviously War Leader, but I think that might be about it because even the uh, 2 2 Deadly that escapes me right now, the, the split knife, jackknife, whatever, Venom, you know mm -hmm. what I'm talking about? The yeah. other campaign one, that guy, as good as he is, he still gets kind of outclassed versus Akanta. Just she can sit on the board, your opponent will ignore her because she's a two one, and then before you know it, all of a sudden she's a beater. So I like her. Sorbet. Um, yeah, I think um, I think all of the ascending cycle cards are all really good because pretty much like most, if you're doing two influence or one influence decks, like most of them are going to have one influence favored where you just kind of build up that influence over the course of the game. Um, and so at any point where um, you hit six influence, um, all of the ascending cards are just way overvalued for their mana cost. Um, but for this one, for this one specifically, um, I thought it was interesting because you said it's kind of only good, or John said that it's kind of only good once it hits the six influence mark, but um, with the symbols in Expedition, um, most of the time you can play this on two, well, not most of the time, but, but a relevant number of times you could play this on two and have the four, uh, influence effect already active when it's attacking for the first time on three. Um, and just getting that like little bit of value over your opponent where you have just like this one extra body, um, basically for free, uh, feels like a good way to, to press an early advantage. Yep. And then there are two drops that are great draws later in the game because then you're getting a unit that's feasible. Yeah. I, I like the ascending as, uh, uh, ascending cycle as well 
but that's gonna do it for shadow you know what we expect in campaign some good cards some interesting some niche but let's move on we're not gonna spend too much time taking broad strokes because not everyone's gonna do it uh this next card overperformed for me in the scion draft my first my first deck was mono shadow my second deck was uh sky crag and this card was sky crag flyers and this card was just busted granted i hope it's as good as in constructive but we'll find out this is isra or isra or isra i'll go with isra isra loyal mount this is a four five serpent for five i wish it would have had drag like dragon serpent but anywho for five double primal it has flying then when one of your units hits a player isra gets a plus one attack permanently summon your other units get flying this turn uh i feel like i talked a lot about the well i'll talk about this one because like i said it, it overperformed for me so i'll at least put my two cents in here i do i don't know where four or five flying a five cost four or five flyer is at right now in the current format because we do have carvet it's a six six flyer for five um and obviously this thing doesn't bode well against sandstorm titan as well but the it, if you have any kind of a board right you have essentially turn two turn three turn four to develop your board and then israel comes down and gives them all evasion even if you're not doing huge things after that that could potentially be a decent swing that your opponent was not expecting and then all of a sudden she's somewhere at like six seven eight. Oh, i guess at best she'll be a oh i guess if you have a one drop anywho she can go anywhere from a six five to a, an eight five flyer that is very difficult for your opponent to deal with uh she goes very well in multiples because then you can easily play another one the next turn and do the same thing so i think there's some serious application to it the summon effect makes it to where you're kind of getting maybe half a card's worth of value when you play her uh and then like i said it's it's somewhat of a relevant size right it does block everything that you're gonna see on the other side of the board in the air for the most part minus carvet and Ikaria um i guess it still loses to aramot so it's horrible against shadow but against fire and uh fire and primal it's pretty good and justice actually well no shoots a dd all right i don't know I, i'm on both sides here i'm on the fence all right sorbet <laughs> save me from this uh i think this card's pretty bad um I, it's not it's like in theory it's it's okay um just because if you're if you're playing it on curve and you do have a board then it's pretty decent but i don't like to uh, to put cards that require having um, a board presence too much um, in my deck, like it, it's only good if you already have a board presence, because then if you just like run into removal heavy decks, then it then it kind of becomes dead weight. Um, and unless it's like it specifically synergizes with token strategies where you can make really wide boards really quickly, um, this card I definitely don't think is competitive enough at the five drop slot for throne so the 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 only place i could really see putting this would probably be in like mono primal um aggro decks in expedition um but then it's competing with like linray stranger um and other kind of higher value cards that that are pretty much always going to be good um it just feels a little too situational for me i guess fair fair point john yeah i, I... I don't think there's any deck that really plays this unless you're just kind of on a budget. Like, don't want to craft all the Linray Strangers. You mm -hmm. could put this in that slot, maybe. <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> or maybe, like, in a five market in Expedition, just to, you know, jump your team. But I kind of feel like the um, there's a, a time spell we'll get to that basically does the same thing, and I feel like that's probably just better most of the time. Okay. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Fair enough. I already talked it up, so we don't have to... You guys, you guys leveled it up, so we're good to go. All right. <laughs> cool. ne next one in this five cost spell, which, John, if you spend this whole podcast talking about five cost Another market. Five cost spell. Oh. <laughs> well, look at them all. Look, this page is full of them. Yeah, yeah I know. there no are kidding. a lot of them. Yeah. I, uh, all right. Here we go. So, Fierce Protection is a slow spell for five triple primal. You and your units get ages. If you have quad, or I'm sorry, five fire influence, kill each enemy weapon. Each weapon in your deck gets plus five attack. If you have five shadow influence, play a card from the enemy void. It gets void bound. 
I gotta admit, I'm very hard pressed to find a good application for this card because <laughs> Aegis at slow speed just feels so horrible. You have to be preemptive and you're essentially taking your what could potentially be your whole turn off to just protect your your guys preemptively so your opponent can play around that. You know, like you're not eating a spell that they only had one of. They can wait until they have two to kill your unit, da da da. Then Killing each enemy weapon, most of the time, you're only going to see one, maybe two in play if they're running like Persuader and a Fury Blade or something. And I mean, I guess it kind of hoses Exalted and then each weapon in your deck. It, it, yes, it pumps each weapon in your deck, but you don't know when you're going to draw them. So unless you're running a tutor effect, like the only and then so you have to be in Skycrag, which right now is just Edge. And Edge, you're not really playing for the beat stick. You're playing it to kill, remove something, and then, you know, loot. I don't know. And then Felm, I mean, again, you want to have something from your opponent's side that's worth spending five power on. It gets void bound, so you can't even do it again. Uh, I don't know. Right. Let me save you, Jedi. Two words. One one word. Whack. <laughs> Okay. All right. Cool. I mean, I, I, I just can't, man. I just can't think of it. Like, what? You, so, in Skycrag, you're running Persuaders and and Edge, and then you're running Blade Crafter. So you play this and then tutor for your weapon. So now you're playing it on turn what? Play this on five, tutor on no. six, play your weapon on seven. Oh God, that uh, they, they don't even have overwhelm. All right, I guess you can maul. You can go go up. So your mall would be an eleven three <laughs> overwhelm. There you go. That that's the tech. That's the tech right there. All right. You've been, uh, you've been doing a pretty good job of devil's advocate, but this card is just hard to deal. No, this card. Well, this card's just bad. It's just bad. It's yeah. really bad. You, you have been doing really good, but this card, it's really hard to kind of sell it. All right. Cool. We'll move on then. I won't waste any more any more time on this. All right. This one is a card that both John. And Sorbet are high on. And I got to admit, I tried uh, Sorbet's first brew with it. And this card is pretty spicy. Uh, this is Jeral Ascending, a 1-3 Shaman Giant. Oh, that's right. The Jotuns aren't aren't Yetis. Okay, fair. Uh, two, two cost, double primal. With four, four primal, four influence. When Jeral attacks, draw a card. Discard it unless it's a spell. At six influence... He gets a plus two, plus two, and Berserk. And then at eight influence, when you play a spell, deal its cost to the enemy player. So if you, for example, play Seer on a unit, then Draw will deal two damage to that player. If you do like what Sorbet was doing and cast, for example, Channel, then Channel will do freaking nine damage. It'll do whatever damage it does because of, you know, drawing cards and what the spell does. But then Draw will do nine damage to their face. So some serious freaking output there. And of obviously drawing multiple cards if you have your deck built that way. All right, that's all I'm going to talk about because I know you and John are going to go off on it. Sending it back to you, Sorbet. Uh, I love this card. This is this is this card's probably my favorite of, of this uh, adventure. Um, I don't know. Just at, e at each point, at each influence point, it's just... It's so much value. So, like, the first one, um, it's so this is okay. So this is the the card in the ascending cycle that requires um, the most deck build around for the card. Um, you just have to have like a, a decent density of spells. But even if you don't have like that much, it's still just incremental value whenever you do draw a spell off of it. Um, and then. It like double synergizes because once you hit that six um, influence point, you get Berserk, um, which just works really well with uh, drawing the extra spells. And then um, the, for, at the last, at the eight influence point, um, if you're playing it at any slow kind of control decks um, or even like slowish mid range decks, it just becomes its own win condition. Um, and all at two mana, I don't know. It seems it just seems like a lot of value. John. Uh, yeah, I mean. I, you said you said I I'm a fan and I I you're correct. <laughs> I I really like this card. Um, I think it's also my favorite of the ascending cards. It wasn't at first like on the surface, but as soon as mm -hmm. I played with it, it became and like I I found out immediately like what Sorbet said, which I agree with that it has a high deck building cost, but it's like it's one that I like. You know, I like decks like that anyway, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> but you know, like it's it's much easier to just attack 
um, after playing a one, three on turn two on any board state, I feel like then with a two, one. Um, mm. So, and like at, at just four, it gets the on attack um, effect. So like in my experience playing with this guy, like you can start drawing cards on turn three, like basically anytime you want. Um, but that's not, that's not when he gets great. Like, it, like like Sorbet was saying, like each each step up on the on the influence ladder here, it just the card just pops off. Like if you build your deck around it, it like you said, becomes its own win condition. Like I, I can't say enough good things about this guy, and he has like one one if not my new favorite uh, voice lines in the game. He sounds exactly <laughs> he exactly like uh, Butthead from Beavis and Butthead, like which obviously I'm a fan of that. So <laughs> from my name, so. All right, and since I got played the other side, I think this card's whack. There's so many aggressive, big beatdown decks like Time. A one three is not going to do squat against them. And then who wants to fill a deck full of spells? It's a three five though. Deck, deck full of spell. What blue decks? <laughs> per- permafrost. Never heard of it. Oh, and here's just another like little interaction that just makes them so good. Like, um, y- y- you're probably playing Seed if you're playing Geral, like oh, yeah. Seed. And so like once once you have that eight influence you know your opponent's obviously like playing around your turn to seeds so they're trying to like put up aegis all the time and things like that well when you play the eight when you play this turn to seed it pops aegis if they have one because of Geral's uh face slapping spell casting ability <laughs> slap <laughs> all right that's... yeah i think i think that's that's actually something that's come up a lot um yes. surprisingly real supply surprisingly relevant is that it draw deals with face ages like really well um not even just for turn to seed but also you know if you're running like, um, incidentally yes incidentally it's like on top of all the other value that it gets it also um so you'll be able to target like your your channel the tempest to their face all right yeah, oh here let me seek power real quick all right there we go boom <laughs> yeah everything's a ping sweet all right, and then our moving on, our final primal card that was seeing a lot of uh, attention during spoiler season is Dazzle. This is a fast spell for two primal primal, and you can choose one of two modes, either stun an enemy unit with cost two or more, then plunder, or negate an enemy spell with cost two or more, then plunder. John? Yeah, I love this card. Um, I already... <laughs> like would uh, you know at least test out main deck encounter spells in a lot of lot more decks than i probably should have um and this is probably the most main deckable negate effect that we've had in eternal um because it can also stun things it can also plunder like that's just all gravy so uh i i've i've found running four of these is uh is not only viable but pretty good in a lot of uh, primal decks um that are you know attacking and uh yeah it's it's a sweet card yeah backlash is uh, i've always i'm like you i've always appreciated a good backlash in a deck to just completely blow out your opponent um i run them in 95 percent of the decks i play primal i run some kind of counter spell and like you said this this mitigates the the niche of only hitting spells with the fact that you can stun units and plunder away extra power or make sure you plunder away your spells that don't do anything for power to get you there M sorbet yeah, I mean this card's this card's amazing. Um, I've I've been playing a lot of it. It's 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 such a it's such a blowout sometimes just because of how much mana you save, like countering their five cost spell with your two drop. Um, and it's so easy to just leave open two mana at the end of your turn, um, force them to play around it even if you don't have it, and even if they don't play a spell and you do have it, you you can still get that um, plunder value. It's just it's just such a resilient card. Yeah, the one issue I have with it is, is is that right now it's on everyone's radar. So anytime you're in Primal and you leave two power up, people play around it, which is a little annoying. Versus Backlash, and, no one ever plays around it. You just get huge blowouts. Yeah. There's also some decks that like most of their impactful spells are like, you know, market access one drops or, you know, like intrusion. That's another one drop. So and then like some of those decks are also you know like the new kira has uh endurance so like the, the yeah. stun doesn't work so it doesn't actually work all the time not but, all the time no yeah you know it's it's i feel like specifically the kira decks which there are there is a good amount of kira decks running around mm-hmm. but um that that's probably the worst deck for dazzle to be matched up against i guess mm. yep all right going into justice we have gold plate valkyrie this is a five six valkyrie for seven justice justice Flying, Endurance, Summon, 
play a unit with cost two or less from your market. Of note, it doesn't say anything about influence costs, so you can essentially run cards in your market that aren't justice and still play this. So obviously you're looking at cards with some kind of niche utility to capitalize on the summon effect potentially. Um, that being said, so what you're getting, you're getting a five, six flyer for five. And then, you know, the two costs, like essentially you're still waiting till you get to seven power, but <clears throat> it could have some utility. I'm trying to think the only one that comes to mind right off the bat would be blight moth. Um, what's another two drop that does some stuff when it comes to play? Like, mm. I mean, teacher of humility needs to attack um i guess I mean, just he, ruffian right uh, yeah, oh yeah, Ruff, yeah ruffian, shot. ruffian's a good one the other one would be probably the alley guide got so you can sabotage maybe um yeah I'm, I'm not nothing is coming off the top of my head like right now i guess you can also use it to get one of the other ascending cards if you have the influence for it right i don't know yeah um Anywho, mm. I'll, I'll let you guys talk about it while I'm thinking about it. So let's send it over to you, John. What do you think of Gold Plate Valkyrie? Yeah, I, I've, I've done some theory crafting with it, and I just haven't come up with anything. So maybe there's nothing really that great in the game yet, or maybe I'm just not seeing it. I don't know. It just seems like understated for the cost, despite the whole, like... I mean, those market slots are very tight, too. So, I mean, mm -hmm. you got to really have a reason to want to do this. And I'm not sure that that's in the game right now. Oh, maybe a luring... A luring kieran right to tax your opponent maybe but by that point if you already have seven maybe. power they're probably oh yeah up there. At, at seven, seven that's not yeah. that's not doing much <laughs> i don't know what do you think sorbet uh um it's it's not very good um you, you like there's no, there's no two drop unit that like you you need for some sort of cool combo stuff um you could do with this and at seven mana cost even even if there was just it's just way too slow i feel like and then on top of that you also have to make your market worse yeah and the embargo officer right is a one or two cost she's a one cost right one cost yeah oh no it says or less so you could still so i guess you could do that you could play <laughs> you could, her to yeah. shut off their market i guess i get that that's probably the most surprised like aha thing I, I can think of is there a two drop that gets ridiculous like later on i mean obviously the the ascendings that we just talked about but yeah but you're you're putting those in the main deck yeah like of all those uh and then the only two drop champion is the sky crag and the rakano one right yeah those aren't very impressive on turn six or seven anyways all right fair enough um and the body yeah like she's in justice so she's obviously competing with sadidi and akaria so yeah, yeah not, not exciting <laughs> i mean the one good news is that she has endurance so she can't get permafrosted and that's kind of a thing right now mm, i don't know i mean maybe in a world where seed is still relevant you use her as the the fourth of something you run three of of everything and then she's in there as like a gap filler i'm not sure okay let's move on next up is silver knight this one i have been seeing and constructed i have yet to put it in a deck yet i'm still kind of playing around with things but silver knight is yeah silver knight and this is knight like nightfall not knight in shining armor uh is a slow spell for five triple justice <clears throat> kill a ready enemy unit gain its attack in armor so of note, you're not getting its attack, you're only gaining its armor, uh, and it has to be ready, so any unit that is exhausted or stunned would not work, would not be a viable target for <clears throat> Silver Knight. Uh, if you have five primal influence, when a unit goes to the enemy void this turn, draw a card. So ideally, when you kill a unit with this, you draw a card, um, or if they mill themselves, but you know it's a slow spell so i'm not sure how that's going to work uh, if you make them discard i guess so you wait when a unit goes to the, so how would this work so question if you kill something right and then mm -hmm. you play um the the from beyond that lets you just make them discard would this retroactively see itself like see the discard even if it's in your void do we mm -hmm. No, oh, okay. it's just for the rest of the turn it's for the rest of the turn okay okay cool just making sure i just wanted to clarify that's what we're here for uh and then if you have five shadow influence kill an exhausted enemy unit 
discard its attack and cards from their deck. So if you're in Argentport, it kills two units? Oh, no, no, kill ready and then kill exhausted. Okay, yeah, yeah, so it kills two. Oh, wow, that's kind of good in Argentport, right? Um, It's okay. <laughs> I think it's better like it's it's so much better if you have all if you have the five primal and the five shadow going on because then you draw, just draw a bunch of cards while killing a bunch of their stuff it's like just value 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 yeah, yeah but, um, but we've already talked about triple influence like that's that's i mean well carvet yeah, makes both of those influences so like i i've literally i i was watching like kaz do some drafting you know scion drafting and like this he, every time he played this card it like drew him four cards and killed two things like it yeah. was it was doing that in draft the, so i imagine it's constructed playable the one... it, it, it is it is definitely constructed playable because um i know i know someone had had posted a, a rank one throne um huru control list that that ran four of these That's cool. um and i i played i played around with it it's it's pretty good i don't think it's like amazing but because you you do get to draw cards and also remove things um it makes it all right and just to be totally um, clear, like it, if you do get the mill off and it mills units, you draw a card for each of those that you know units that gets milled too. That's like why that's on the card, oh, right? Oh, um, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, that's the that's kind of good. Biggest synergy it had with um with the Huru control list was with the um the zero mana um removal spell. If you have Aegis, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. bring the justice. Um, yeah. So so you you play this and then you just you just ping off um one or two other people and you and you draw some cards um it's just it feels kind of awkward when i was playing it um if you're up against like fire based aggro decks uh because most of the time they're just not going to have a ready unit and so it's just going to sit kind of awkwardly in your hand right well i mean you're also talking about a five cost slow spell removal spell against a fire deck that's (laughs) that's bad as it is already that's not definitely not where you want to be the the one thing to note as well is the fact that blocking does exhaust the unit. So there is a chance where you can set this up to be beneficial for you post-combat mm-hmm. where you, there's some blocks that they don't want to make, but there are some blocks that they do. So they just take a little bit of damage, block something, and you essentially can get your your unit's worth back in killing theirs, et cetera, et cetera. So just something to think about as well with Silver of Night. I think this is all of them... All of these these versions obviously are very complex cards because they have so many variations to them. But I think this one has the potential of of having multiple formulas for success, for lack of a better term. Yeah, this one's this one's pretty good. Yep. Yeah, so, it's so, like a decent removal. Yep. Next up, we have Kira Ascending, and then shout out to Yoda Byte as Kira was the card. This card specifically was not the one designed by Yoda Byte, but Kira is the character that took shape thanks to Yoda Byte's uh, custom card. So shout out to Yoda Byte, the first person to be able to purchase their custom card. And ironically, they I think a month ago now, they purchased their card back as well. So shout out to Yoda Byte for just having a huge amount of influence. But all right. Kira Ascending is a 3-2 Unseen for 2 Justice Justice. At 4 Influence, when you play a spell directly on Kira, draw a card. 6 Influence, she gets a plus 2, plus 2, and Endurance. And at 8 Influence, when Kira attacks, give another attacking unit her attack and health. Uh, That is extremely powerful. Uh, I've been playing around with her with Huru, and all four variations of her are great. Uh, currently the 3-2 isn't that impressive there's a lot of more aggressive mid-range decks where she gets out class there but you don't hate playing her because she could just sit on the board and be a target of course uh, both finest hour and uh was it silver blade intrusion right i know it's intrusion mm-hmm. what's the yeah uh oh, it will allow her to block or attack freely and draw you a card to replace it her becoming a five for endurance is extremely powerful if you guys remember the original shenron when she got her mastery going off and then yeah if you get to influence eight influence with kira like she's just so difficult to deal with because you know she attacks she automatically gives something a plus five plus four permanently heaven forbid you have something like a spell a pump spell to make it worse i've done that before where i will finest hour her pre-combat and then attack to give my akari in the air a plus whatever plus eight plus uh seven so 
Trick shot ruffian too. Oh yeah, there you go. That's another. Yep, I've done that one as well. So I, I like Kira. Uh, like you guys, like we've talked about already. I think the ascendings are all five of them are great, and they have their own applications in specific. But Kira seems like one of the stronger ones. Anytime you can get value off of the four influence thing, I think you're doing very well. And Kira does a good job of that. People are running the Justice Envoy. I forgot the name of it, but it's the two two for three that does the same thing about drawing you a card. Granted, I will say this, that one draws you a card regardless of who cast it versus Kira. It has to be you that p plays the card, but I don't know. I, I think Kira's solid. Uh, Sorbet, I think it's your, yeah, you're up first. Um, Kira's, Kira's great. Kira, Kira has um, basically already spawned um, her own archetype in, that's that's competitively viable both in, in Throne and Expedition. Um, because, it's, because it's redundant with Huru Envoy, which is the... Um, the three mana two two, um, where you just you just run a bunch of cheap uh, cantrips or, or or combat tricks um, and Kira Huru Envoy um, something like Alessi uh, other other things that that gain incremental value off of um, those tricks and uh, kind of snowball early advantage um, with. Uh, cards that that can protect both Kira or Huru Envoy, um, and you just draw a bunch of cards and then win. Yep, that makes sense. It's, I like it. I'm all about an aggressive <laughs> Huru deck. It's one of the things that I won uh, the uh, Tuesday Night Eternal tournament with was Huru Ag or whatever the one that was. Oh, I always forget his name now. I feel so bad. Um, John, do you remember the the brewer a long time ago? Bloom, corpse bloom? No, not corpse bloom. Knife, knife bloom. Knife bloom. Thank you. There you go. Knife bloom. See, at least I remember <laughs> half his name. All right, John, what do you think about Kira before we move on? I don't think I really have anything to add, uh, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, I'm a fan of Kira as well. I, I I like those style decks. I think she like like I'm sort of base said basically spawned a new archetype of sorts. Like you know, it's it's almost an extension of something that was already there. But you know. It's yeah. uh yeah, it's sweet. She's she's fun. She's fun to brew with and she's fun to play. Nice. All right, our final justice card is Pending Execution. This is a curse for one justice. At the start of your turn, kill the cursed unit. When the cursed unit hits you, sacrifice Pending Execution. So essentially, it is a curse so you have to play it on your turn and then it will not kill the unit till all the way uh, until it's your turn again so the opponent has one chance for that unit to deal damage to you the player to essentially escape execution uh, it can damage one of your units it could be blocked etc it could you know uh detain make its attack it has to damage you if not then it will die at the beginning of your next turn so and eh, it's removal it does a thing i i obviously see that's the thing this could potentially be playable and limited right we saw <laughs> inflict conscience and this is this is kind of in that alley but i just don't see how this would ever be played and constructed i i think even even if the uh purpose or huru or uh, Arjun Port curse decks or any variant thereof come back into the meta. There's just way better options than this. I don't know. I have nothing for you guys. Do you guys have anything to add to right. this? It's not I'll, great. I'll be devil's advocate here. Ooh. Um, Ooh. This, this card is terrible. Am okay. I doing it right? Yep, you <laughs> did a great job. All right, sweet. Pending execution, you are executed. Okay, or pending execution. I think I said that right. All right, moving into time. Sewer Kudzu. I'm surprised this card I haven't seen more of and constructed, to be honest with you, but I could oh. be wrong. I don't know. <laughs> Anywho, Sewer Kudzu is an 8 4 Mandrake for 6 time time. Has Overwhelm, and then in Tomb, if it's your turn, draw Sewer Kudzu from your void. So obviously, if it dies in combat or you sacrifice it, it or something like that once again on your turn then you immediately get to draw it so you can replay it if it dies blocking or your opponent well i guess fast speed wouldn't matter because then that'd be on your turn if they if they kill on their turn then it just dies and that's all she wrote so it is situational i think it can be played around fairly easily but obviously there's board states as well where it 
wouldn't i don't know i, I think the card has to okay i don't think it's like an auto include i don't think this card's super busted but i like the fact that it's eight attack with overwhelm so it means it it, it attacks profitably it tussles with pretty much everything in the format there's actually nothing in the format bigger than this guy uh he even he can even take on uh tuvon which i think is the biggest unit in the tuvon and um Severn are the two biggest units I think we're I mean, seeing. There's a not yeah, that's Steve play. There's a not a nine nine like boating rocks is oh sure, there, but no one's playing that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a, yeah. I said what seeing play, John. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Why, why you, gotta, why you gotta bust me, bust my chops like that, man? I'm like, really? Am I missing something? <laughs> I'm like, even the even the eight eight from. Uh... Well, I mean, this week we're seeing like twenty twenties with this Kira nonsense going around, but fair fair uh so even the giant off of kato uh doesn't you know this thing still takes it out or whatnot so i don't know mm -hmm. john uh i think the reason we're not seeing this played right now is because of the cost like six is just too much really um for something that doesn't immediately do something when it comes into play right like mm -hmm. you, you could just play grow stranger which does you know which is essentially about the same size no overwhelm but it, you know it does something when you play it you could play tuvon which does have overwhelm seven seven draws a card basically when you play it because you can activate it like after playing at the end of the opponent's turn before they have a chance to do anything like i think tuvon is like just basically better than this but i would understand like if somebody is on a budget you know they get the campaign but don't have four tuvons you might try some some kudzu in like that slot but i think that's why we're not just seeing it played because i do think it's on paper it's pretty decent but there's just kind of better stuff at six cost and time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh of note this thing goes really good with uh killer the this... it does but there's like an expedition for example where you you know i think would look to play it there like there's just not a lot of ways to give killer so yep fair enough uh, m sorbet do you have anything that um yeah i think this card's pretty bad even on paper i don't think it's very good just because um when you have late game units um, like anything that costs this much, especially six or more, um, it has to do something the turn you play it. Otherwise, you know, it just gets removed and, and you've wasted an entire turn or, um, even, even just having like an eight, four body for six mana, um, not great, uh, especially because it also doesn't block well. So it's like a whole turn cycle before you can get any value out of it because you're only really getting value when you've attacked. Mm -hmm. Of note as well, the four health means it dies to Jack. Yep. Ugh. Yeah. All right. Uh, here's a card that I haven't, I have it in my decks and I haven't gotten a chance to pull it out of the market yet, but I'm super excited to play it. This is Word of Power. This is a slow spell for five triple time. Your units get deadly and overwhelm. So as you guys may or may not know, it is an absolute great combo because overwhelm means that it, the unit will do damage all the necessary damage it needs to kill the unit that is blocking it and everything else rolls over to the opponent well when the unit's deadly it only has to do one damage to kill it so if you're attacking with a 5-5 with deadly and overwhelm it will only do one damage to whatever unit it is blocking doesn't matter if it has two or 20 health and then the other four will roll over to the opponent's face so that on the on itself is already pretty good i will say once again it is a slow spell so your opponent does see it coming there's no major blowouts which is i'm not sure if that would or would not have been overpowered i'm not sure anywho for uh five justice influence when a unit attacks this turn play a 2-2 weapon on it so this is a permanent 2-2 should the unit survive and then if you have five Ju or primal influence your units go berserk which honestly i feel like that just closes out the game so essentially this is a tradition card with time justice and primal um, sending it back over to you john sure I, i'm i'm like happy with just this is just a time card like I, i'm using this as a as a finisher in my market for a lot of time decks right now um without any concern for the justice or the primal parts of it at all like if you're on if you're wide board and your units are just kind of you know relatively thick time units that are lacking evasion this just like you know you, it's easy to do the math too uh you, you can just play this and win the game in a lot of board states and you know I, i've said it so many times tonight but i'll say it again five cost market um you know it's in time already which that's the color of the five cost market so 
easy slot there in a lot of decks. Um, if you can do one of those other things, I think, you know, that makes it just even more likely. You know, it's like in in some games, it'll maybe get that insta-kill one turn sooner or something. But I think for the most part, you're just happy giving your full board deadly and overwhelm because that just wins the game. Like, this card's sweet. Um, I, I'm not sure, like, any deck would main deck this or anything or if, or if there's, like, a a deck to make use of all the modes or that you even care to like even the berserk seems like overkill in most board states where because like the thing is is that first attack like if your units aren't all, aren't just huge then they're just trading for the most part anyway so they don't even get to attack a second time um and if they're huge then all that is just carrying over anyway and they're probably just dying so like i don't even see the berserk being all that relevant or the weapons thing like i'm just really all about that first line of text I, I think this is going to bring a resurgence in both Praxis tokens and just be another finisher for rats. I wonder if this is better than Bizarre or not. I'm not 100% sure, but uh, definitely in, in I see this being a decent finisher because a lot of those Praxis token decks ran the, uh, you know, they run the plus one and plus two effects, the obelisks and whatnot. So this thing, the turn that you're like, okay, I have decent blocks, et cetera, et cetera. Then all of a sudden, all the guys have deadly and overwhelm can definitely overwhelm your board and kill you. So, by anything that? Um, yeah. So when um, when the set when the um, adventure first came out on ladder, uh, I went up against the deck that was basically um, just the three colors of the evangels, like all like four copies of each, um, and then. Um, I think uh, I'm pretty sure they they got this out of their market. So you have you have your um, merchants and then you crack the earth, um, just like a bunch of different ways to pull it out of the market. And so all it did was it just tried to set up as wide a board as possible, hit the influence requirements, cast this card, and then just instantly win. Um, sure. And it worked. It beat me. It was it was a very cool deck. I think I think there's there's a lot to explore um, with this card, especially because um, for like wide boards, um, if you have the berserk and you have the plus two plus two weapons um even if you have just a bunch of like one ones they they hit for um first three then five mm -hmm. so it's just it's just a way to win and of course you can always go maximum greed with this and either souls rest or striking snake formation and just go to town but i mean obviously that's mm -hmm. a preposterous amount of power all right <laughs> moving on to the next one this card is starting to see some play and this is the counter to uh turn to seed that we had preluded to earlier and this is much like what john was saying where seed instantly became a threat and a lot of people hate the card and direwolf didn't do anything to it but lo and behold in the very next set we're seeing a pseudo counter to it this is hermit gardener this is in six five exile which i don't i think yeah though there's minimal exiles in this format or in the game yet anywho Five double time summon each of your little seeds, which is the the seed that turn to seed makes ultimates two turns sooner. Then play two o two little seeds. So of note that the seeds this guy plays will not see his summon effect, so they will still get the usual five turns to trigger into the five seven overwhelms that they are, but. The other thing I will say, Little Seed does say at the beginning of your turn on the fifth turn transform, but we've confirmed it by playing with it. If you have seeds in play, they're at three turns so far and you play Gardener, they will become five sevens right away. Uh, I think that's where you really capitalize on this. It kind of punishes your opponent, obviously, a little bit for playing seeds. I, I really think you just want to ambush your opponent because they're going to try to milk that for all it's worth and wait till they hit that fourth turn to kill them. Uh, if you play, I mean, if you need to develop your board, you develop your board. But having a seed at one or two and then playing this so they go to three or four, sometimes they'll get to go off. Sometimes your opponent's going to have the answer and they'll be ready. But overall, and then a six, five for five is, is not bad. It tussles with almost everything in the format that we care about. Um, obviously, there's a few things that are still an issue, but it is what it is. Uh, obviously, it gives you three bodies. Even if the two bodies that come with it aren't 100% relevant, it still gives you three bodies. It can attack while leaving chump blockers. So I think I think this card is fine. I don't. If you hate seed, then definitely put these in your deck. I don't think you're. I still don't think you're running four of them. But I'm not 100%. Sorbet. 
I like this card. I like this card a lot, actually. Um, uh, I haven't I haven't tested much with it, but I probably should. I think for five mana, six five is already a solid body. And then even if you don't have already have seeds because your opponent's playing, you know, justice, it's it still comes up with uh, with two bodies that are relevant. Like they have to be answered at some point, otherwise otherwise they will slap uh, for lots of damage. So I don't know. I think this card's pretty solid. And you know what, now that I think about it, I, you probably could easily run four of them because they work good in multiples because the first mm -hmm. one's not going to do anything, but the second one is going to plus up the two from the first, the two seats from the oh, first yeah, one. Oh, yeah, yeah, so for sure. I could see that. John? I think you guys have said most of it. Like, he's solid. Um, I don't think you hate just playing this as a five drop in in time decks, especially like an expedition. Mm -hmm. um, you could you could consider it like a market card if you just hate seeds too, like in some decks. But like I think <laughs> I think he's just, he's mostly like a main deck card and I think he's pretty much just fine with stats. Um, and like maybe, you know, maybe some kind of uh, deck that just needs bodies for like sack and stuff too. Maybe just plays this as a top end that brings two friends for fodder too, you know, maybe it's worth trying there. Yep. He he does work in Xenon and just Destruction solid. for sure. Lots of value, and mm -hmm. you could potentially give him overwhelm and deadly. Eh? Yeah, eh? all all he's missing like on the surface is just some evasion or like you just said. So like th that's like the only downside of the card, right? Like it's just a lot of value otherwise. Uh, you could reanimate him with scream and with uh, the Doctor Zytron. So yeah, one of the better targets for that. It looks like just because sure. that you know it it does leave behind the seeds when it flickers into play momentarily or whatever. Yep, and gets him for six. All right, time's final card is Al Heed or Al Head Ascending. This is a 3 3 warrior dinosaur for two double time. So the original Teacher of Humility. For four influence, your attacking units have decay, which is great. It makes blocking a living nightmare for your opponent. If you, have, if you have six influence, he gets a plus two, plus two, and overwhelm. And then at eight influence, when you play another unit, Alheed gets that unit's attack and health permanently. M. Sorbet? Um, yeah, this card's uh, very good. Um, it's kind of the, the, the like big dumb idiot of the Ascending Cycle, where it's just like a bunch of stats. Um, but then on top of that, it also has relevant abilities for your whole team. Like in any big time deck, um, it's just an auto include. Like attacking units having decay is is pretty great. And then just as as the game gets later and later, like once you hit the eight influence point, um, this thing just becomes huge and and maxim. Yeah, and obviously it combos really well, which we're seeing with the. Oh, I can't believe I forgot the name of it now. I could tell you every single time the four one overwhelm. That it comes back when you play a unit with five attack or greater. Either of you guys remember it off the top of your heads? Uh, Don Walker. Thank exactly. you, Don Walker. Yep, giving Don Walker killer, and then having Al Heed in play, it will killering activating killer does count as an attack, so it will attack with decay. Which oh god, it's preposterous. Oh, it's yeah, so and good. like with just the six time, like he's big enough to return him if you draw him later on. Like the allies mm -hmm. will bring mm -hmm. back Don Walkers. Yeah. Yeah, card's good, and then obviously just playing a three three for two in time is is something you want to be doing as well. So yeah, um, time has the the trail maker to get you extra influence. I'm trying to think. We're seeing there's a aggro deck, a time mono time aggro deck that John introduced me to that is quite efficient that uses time walker and uh, the evangel the time evangel to rock it out i'll heat early and big time units so yeah it, it's guy has definitely seen some some play already in making waves i think that out of all the ascendings this is the one that stood out the most to everyone and he's he's it's for a good reason mm -hmm. yeah he's the most obviously good i think sorbet said it right like he's just the big dumb idiot of the <laughs> yeah, you just, cycle right in your big time decks you just you just put him in because there's you no don't reason really, not to like there's no real deck building requirements that he's asking of you he just wants you to play mm -hmm. him and have a lot of time influence <laughs> yep yeah okay next up starting off with fire we have coronation ritual this is a fast spell this time for five triple fire 
Sacrifice a unit to play two incarnations with the attack and health equal to its attack. So for example, should you sacrifice the Inferno Zealot, which is the 8-1, you will get two 8-8 incarnations. Uh, that being said as well, if you sacrifice, I don't know, what's in fire, um, Jack, then you will get to two twos because it's based on their attack. Uh, let's see. Then if you have five time influence, they get plus health and plus attack equal to the sacrifice unit's health. So essentially it doubles it, right? So if we're going back, if you sacrifice, what's at four? All right, let's go to Jack again. You sacrifice a Jack, then they will get the, they will be two two twos because of his attack, but then they will get an additional plus three plus three because of his health creating two five fives. I know that's a lot of numbers. Hopefully you guys listening at home or in the car understood that. And then finally, if you have five justice influence, they get its battle skills. So if said Jack had double damage, then you get two five fives with double damage. Did I explain that correctly or did, was that confusing? That's uh, so good. Okay, cool. All right, Sorbet, let's... uh. Start off with you, man. What, what do you what this, do you think? This one's interesting. I think um, the the home for this one, um, when I look at it, is probably like um, Praxis big spells kind of deck. Um, and I think the the big combo that stands out is this and Arcanum Battery. So you, you play a discounted Arcanum Battery, then you play this with the uh, with the full time effect, um, and you get what um, twelve two twelve twelves. Uh, plus, I uh, think uh, it should trigger a five, the, uh, four, the yeah. Arcane and Battery ability, so you get the 5-4 too. Definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's that's the home that I, that when I first see this card, that's where it stands out the most. Yeah, I, that being said, it, it, it does have a home in Rakano because of Trickshot Ruffian and Friends in Low Places, right? True. I mean, it... it you. You pump a guy, you swing, the opponent's either going to chump block or take it, and then you do this to cash in that unit for two bigger units. That's kind of relevant, I think. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, it, it seems um, like play style wise, it probably doesn't fit too much in, in Rakano just because right. um, they're trying to like just end the game like by pushing damage at that point. Uh, I mean, I think. There, there's, always, uh, there's always the threat of. Uh, Val Rakano Valks. That's I mean that's interesting. At least that's a I, it's something I hadn't thought of. Um, I, I, I like I've seen I've I've had an opponent like play this and just it looked so cool. Like they were doing kind of like what M Sorbet was saying. Um, like it was basically like a big like five cost spell matter thing. You know, mm -hmm. like the whole the whole deck was pretty interesting. And this it it made this card look pretty good actually. And I'm. I, th I think there's definitely some potential there. Uh, this, this one's uh, this one's gonna get some brew time with me for sure. Yep, for sure. Uh, I'm trying to. Th I guess it it has. I mean, this is probably never mind. It's living the dream. I was like, I guess it works with Doctor Zytron because you can play Zytron and then Coronation Ritual, whatever you take. But that's oh, that's, that's nine so power. Mental. Yeah, <laughs> that's nine power. That's too much. All right, uh, uh, all right. Yeah, this card definitely has some potential for sure. I think. This one, I think there's some serious application for both versions of it, for sure. Um, I guess it's probably a good market card with Mono Fire, right? Because I don't know. It's the turn after. Mm -hmm. It's the turn after Siege Engine, so you can get in one attack with Siege Engine. It's a fast spell as well, so there's a chance that you attack with Siege Engine if your opponent has a removal spell for it or some kind of prop. Well, they'll, if they have a removal spell, they'll do it before you attack. And they maybe double block it or something. I don't know. I think there's a little bit of application, or maybe it's a good uh, counter to going up against primal decks where they have the permafrost, right? Inherently, mono fire is really bad against permafrost, so you could just sack that unit to make bigger ones. I don't know. Right? Yeah. Um. I I do like that that it's a fast spell. I think I think that makes it even better. And I already thought thought it was pretty solid. Yep. Yeah, oh yeah, and then once again, the whole ambushing your opponent at the end of their turn, like, boom, mm -hmm. all of a sudden I have this much on the board, so. Yeah. Okay, uh, next up, we have Defective Flame Bot. This is a 4-4 Grenadine for 4 double fire. Decay, 
When a spell is played directly on defective flame bot, it deals three damage to the enemy player. Of note, it doesn't matter which person plays the or which player plays the spell on flame bot, it will always deal the three damage to the opponent. So that means you could play a pump spell on it and it'll hit the opponent. It's the opponent can attempt to kill it and it will shoot the opponent. Uh, and then obviously it has decay. So if they have any weapons, it'll mitigate the weapon. And uh, I think think that's it uh i have someone was running it with amplify cards or right sir right it's amplifies the word i'm talking about the like bottoms up yeah like bottoms up mm -hmm. okay I, I i for a second i questioned it yeah yeah because the mtg one is kicker yeah okay uh, <laughs> it took i just sorry i spaced for a second i was like wait i'm using the right term uh, I, do you know if it it won't does it trigger multiple times on amplify no right well no not if you go like bottoms up twice on it but yeah okay no but if you had like two in play you could go bottoms up on the one and the other and it would do both yeah okay just making sure yeah, yeah, yeah. okay cool yep that's flame bot so john what do you think i think it's like it's solid you know it's a four four <laughs> for four dk yeah. like yeah it's solid um i don't, I don't think like I, I maybe in like um I don't know. Like, I, I think there's some applications there. I've seen people playing this card. Like, I've seen people trying to do like mono fire and like touch of uh, touch of force, like giving this thing double damage, which means its pings deal double damage. You know, so it does six. Um, I haven't lost any of those games, but it yeah. it almost did. It almost looked good. Like, I don't know. I I think I think there's something there, and it's a, it's a, it's kind of fun. But I'm not sure it's really it's like good enough. So yeah, that's it's it seems like it's good but just not good enough to see like any play really i don't think um because i think there are just better things see, um, especially in the four drop slot see i don't Jack. know i think that's that might actually be good enough though because when you really look at mono fire and Jack. and the more aggressive fire decks right whether it's Rakano or stone scar it, i mean stone scar is kind of the exception there's some ridiculous cards in there but sometimes it, it it's just a combination of medium cards that are just aggressive enough right and one way or another this is going to get its card worth of value back if not more so i don't know i i think i think it's it's got a place for sure in, in some cases this is actually a little bit better than than siege engine and i'm sorry gibbon but you know if they have the removal spell for this it's at least going to deal three versus sometimes siege engine just dies it has sure. it has less potential to run away with the game, but I don't know. Let's see. Siege exactly. Engine is also something that's like hard to block, and I don't know. This is just a four four with decay though, so it's somewhat hard to block too. But okay, fair enough. I, I think it's not busted, but I think it. it I don't. I wouldn't shame anyone for for playing that guy. Yeah, there's no shame. It's like it's good. It's just not great. Fair. Mm -hmm. You know, and then obviously we we uh, we have to wait to see what the expedition format looks like. So all these cards could be complete garbage or completely viable, depending on what expedition looks like. Mm -hmm. All right, getting to the home stretch here. Second, to the last card in fire, Reactor Forge. This is a relic for two fire. At the start of your turn, get plus one power this turn. Then increase this ability by one. At the end of your turn, take one damage for each power Reactor Forge gave you this turn. So essentially when you play it, the following turn will ramp you one, the turn after that ramps you two, the turn after that ramps you three, etc, etc. Each time dealing more damage to your face. I can't remember off the top of my head. Actually, I haven't played this with a, a faction that has face ages yet. So I can't confirm if I don't think so. I'm pretty sure your face ages doesn't block your own stuff. No, it's nah. not. Okay, cool. Just double. I, I just wanted to throw it out there. Uh, so this card, I've played around with it in big Praxis, or just your standard Praxis ramp, and it's actually performed quite well for me. That being yeah. said, I have died to it a couple of times, whether <laughs> it's up against an aggressive deck or just I kind of, the opponent answers all my threats or I run out of gas and then it's still sitting there. Uh, I've seen people combo it, including myself, with a card in the market that could potentially bounce it, like pause for reflection or something, to get it out of the way, or some incidental life steal so you counteract it. But man, it definitely ramps you. It, getting three turns of ramp off this thing, I've dropped a 
a Kairos fairly early with still having power to play stuff, it, it can really steamroll the game. I think later in the game, you're just going to ship it to the market. You really want to play this in turn two or, or three at the latest, but it, it's high risk, high reward for sure. So this can lead to some fun things. Talir combo is a thing as well. Uh, you have some insane not flame blast what's the yeah yeah flame blast insane flame blast with this i flame blast my opponent for like 18 with this so there, there's some shenanigans to be had with this card but yeah the decks that want it are going to want it you really want to capitalize on the power in the top end if you're trying to cap off at three or four or five power then you don't need this you really want to be abusing this at seven eight or nine sorbet um, yeah, I think uh, I haven't I haven't done much testing with it, and this is kind of like a weird card that I feel like you have to experiment with a bunch before you know quite how good it is. But on paper, it seems really good because I mean, playing it on two, you know, and then just snowballing, cheating on just so much mana, it feels feels like you can you can do some pretty uh, dirty things with it. John, uh, I haven't broken it yet. I've done some brewing with it. <laughs> um, and like, I mean, Jedi's, Jedi basically said like, you know, the kind of low side use is just like, yeah, just try it, you know, slot it into like just a practice ramp shell or whatever and see how it does. And like, yeah, it, it, it does. It works. Like it, it really ramps you fast, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, turn six it, it, channel the cool Tempest. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a really cool card. Like it. I, I think I think it still has potential to like be broken in some deck. Um, I'm not sure anyone's found that yet. Um, but it's 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 a solid card. It's it's very playable for sure. Um, and not just not just in some combo. Like you can literally just try it, just ramp into like practice with it. It's cool. Yep. Let us know if you guys have broken it or seen it on ladder. Let us know in the Discord because uh, I'm all about some reactor forge. I don't know. I kind of like the tempo that it get. Like you, you're on a clock, right? It's not only that you're doing amazing things, but you better win because if not, you're gonna kill yourself. I, I, I like the, I don't know, burning the uh, burning the candle from both ends type feel. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and now our final card from the campaign. So we're gonna start off with you, Alex. This is Cloda, the ascend or Cloda ascending is a three one explorer explorer. Ex Why do I feel like I'm saying that wrong? Anyway, explorer gunslinger for two fire fire at four influence when Cloda attacks plunder. So of note, this is not a treasure trove. You plunder. So you either obviously turn a power into a treasure or anything that's not power into a power of its respective color and if you're jedi if you plunder something that has two factions you're going to get the influence that you do not want 100 percent of the time at six influence it, you, she gets a plus two plus two in quick draw making her a five three quick draw and at eight influence when you play a treasure trove your units get a permanent plus one attack. Of note of as well that she potentially can fuel that effect by the plunder from the first effect. All right, Alex, start us off here. How do you feel about Cloda? Um, I'm not sure like how much impact she would have on the meta, either one, but I know there's definitely a spot waiting for her in my mono red deck. Um, it's not that hard to get to four or six uh, pips, you know, and then even eight pretty easily. And then you have the little uh, bonus on the go wide theme, which that deck for me does anyways with the corrupted daggers. I'm talking specifically my mono red deck, so I don't know what other decks it would work into, but it's a it's a pretty good two drop. It could replace uh, the covetous strangers um, and you would get the plunder. I mean, the you would get the treasure trove eventually, or you can get power if you need it, if you're getting hosed on power. Um, and then getting the six is pretty easy. And then a five, three attacker that has a uh, quick draw is pretty, it's a pretty good attacker for an aggressive deck. So yeah, I like, I like her. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? The, the only question I have is that I feel like her first ability kind of clashes with the rest because you want to get more influence, but the plunder makes you want to cash in your power for to draw. You, you get what I'm saying? Like, I, I feel mm -hmm. like there's a bit of a clash there. It, it will help you get if you're kind of more mid rangey. 
the same thing like for example alex you're using your daggers right so you, every influence you have works to improve your flash fire improve your daggers but then her first of plunder ability makes you want to cash in those powers for treasure troves right or, or am i like i'm not quite sure i don't know does that make sense to you guys yeah it makes um i mean for for most aggro decks that you're going to be putting her in um you don't particularly care like you'd much rather just to have another card than uh, the the influence um so you're still you're still pretty okay with plundering got you and then yeah i guess if yeah, you run um, the evangels and the symbols you can you can get at least the six influence fairly quickly and not require a lot of power yeah i think i think this um i think clodo is probably the worst of the ascending cycle um she feels like the easiest to remove and also um kind of the least relevant abilities like plundering is good and all but it's it's it doesn't like affect the board um like some of the other ones do or doesn't like instantly draw you cards um i think it's still especially in expedition still playable you still probably put it in all of your um fire based aggro decks Mm -hmm. um but especially especially the eight influence um which i don't think you're, you're getting too much especially in the those aggro decks but um it's kind of it's kind of weird that um you have to attack to plunder first and then you would play the treasure shows after you attack so you don't even get the bonus um, that being said though unless, that, unless you're just holding on to it that the, being the troves it does work well with the silexes though right getting the free treasure and then still getting the benefit of pumping your team yeah, yeah. It just seems like such a such a mild benefit when you compare it to the the eight influence things from all the other ones. Because mm -hmm. um, like Allen just gets huge super quickly. Like Kira's is insane. Jarral wins the game. Um, this one just seems like such torch. a such a small benefit. Like I and, yeah, and and dies torch yeah. Like I I know that they they've stuck with the same format where the six influence is what changes the stats but i wish they gave her a quick draw first and then the plunder second at least so she could attack a little bit better mm -hmm. alec or i'm sorry john i don't really have anything to add on cloda like <laughs> other than i guess the last one had one of my favorite voice lines in the game and i haven't heard this one yet <laughs> i hope it's good <laughs> Fair. It's your unlucky day. <laughs> that was her. Fair enough. But all right, that is going to do it for the Awakening campaign. Overall, some uh, some high hitters, some mediums, and some lows, which is great. I think that's fine that they added a plethora of not everything being busted. So it, you have to buy this to, to compete in the meta and that there's cards to brew around. I, I think I enjoy it. I, 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 I got it, obviously. Like, I mean, straight up, I'm, I'm going to buy every card I can because I just like this game and like playing them but i i think it's good buy i i don't think it's the best campaign to get i could be wrong i don't know john what do you think is do you yeah think if you can only get one right like I, I think maybe like the last one the one before is maybe like the the most excellent cards that are expedition legal and playable in both formats but like yeah this this one's fine yep and, and, and it, this one actually had a playable campaign, which actually was kind of annoying at first. Oh. But all, as soon as it dropped, all I wanted to do was brew, and I, I, I almost sent like a tech support thing. I like couldn't figure out why. Like, where are my cards? <laughs> well, I um the, the first day it came out, I didn't even know. I was I was just laddering with my old decks, and then all, I'm seeing these new cards. I'm just like, where <laughs> are these coming from? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I I actually like the little stories, right? Because it gives you an excuse to play with the cards that you may not play eventually or whatnot i don't mind it i, I know oh, some I just, people i know I some, this campaign i just try to rush through it as quickly yeah. as possible i mean, I, don't, I, I, don't. I, I will give you that I, I, as far as the actual campaign goes this is probably one of my least favorite ones for sure but i mm -hmm. personally am okay with the campaign aspect of it i know some people just want their cards uh yeah that, i just forgot about it because they didn't even give us one the last few times i like wasn't even thinking about it yeah no doubt you know? no doubt i agree though like i like having them generally but this one was particularly medium yeah and it, maybe it was just a rush job because of the covid thing who knows who knows no yep. fair enough but, cool, though. But, all right that is once again awakening so we're gonna going gonna end up going a little long but that's all right we don't mind we wanted to make sure we get the content for you guys so i hope you guys enjoyed and appreciate that review but we're going to move right along into our what's the play where we take a specific 
seen from a game that we feel might have an interesting line or multiple lines and figure out what the best line is. So this one, our opponent is on Stone Scar, one of seven power. We are at Praxis with seven of seven power. Our opponent's at 22 life. We are at 15. And then the board state consists of our opponent having the 5-2 Arachnid, the 6-3 Pit Fighter, and then the 2-2 Lurking Brute. Our board state is the 1-3 Patroller, 8-8 Giant, and the 5-3 Brawler with Overwhelm. In our hand, we have the 8-8 Omen Scar Worm for 8, Quad Time, Influence of note, we are lacking our fourth time influence to play the Omen Scar Worm as well as our eighth power. We have a Dark Fire, which is the five cost spell that we talked about in our pack one pick one, where it deals damage equal to the highest attack amongst units you control. A Rampage, which is the two fire fast spell plus three plus one and overwhelm until end of turn. And then a five three Arcanum Battery, or not Arcanum Battery, that's the rare, a uh, Battery Mage for five time time. It is our turn, and uh, yeah, so M Sword Bay, let's start off with you, my friend. What are you looking to do here? All right. Um, well, I mean, I don't, I don't know too much about the draft meta, so I'm not, I'm not uh, super well versed on what I think the opponent might have in hand. But um, to me, it looks like we've got the better board, um, and we probably want to start pushing damage. Um, so what I would probably do is um, dark fire the six three. And then attack with the eight eight and the five three. Um, I don't because I just don't think they have good blocks after that. Um, like worst case, they trade their five two with your five three, and then they're left with a two two. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's I think probably my play. And then you just hold up the uh, the combat trick. Okay. Um, uh, so potentially on the next turn, I guess if they uh, don't block and they decide to attack with the arachnid, you could. Uh, block with your one three and and pump it to trade if you need to okay fair enough yeah yeah that's that sound definitely something that was on the table all right so um i know i'm sorbet so you don't draft a lot and you're not intimately familiar with the format but i'm pretty familiar with the format and i'm like (laughs) not i'm like not really scared of anything here so like i'm looking to just wreck my opponent's whole day here with this uh so in our hand we have we have the power to do this we have like we can rampage on our giant to to make him like huge and overwhelm um what is it 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 becomes like an 11 9 and then you can like just dark fire their face for 11 and attack with your two overwhelm guys and the opponent you can dark fire face yeah i didn't even know i thought it had to be yeah it's like oh wow secret oh (laughs) yeah you space Dark fire face for eleven. Yeah, that seems pretty good. And smash them. I was Boom. totally what are they gonna do? John stole my line. <laughs> yeah, I'm like basically I'm not afraid of anything right there. With yeah, one. there's oh. nothing they can really do for one. There's multiple things we could have done here, right? We could easily attack, leave up the rampage, and still have the battery mage to replace. <laughs> um but yeah we end up doing the math and exactly what john said is what i ended up doing this game where i looked and i was like well giving that means two of the guys that are swinging in are gonna have overwhelm so we're, and all their guys are high attack low health so it's gonna be a bunch of damage going across so yes they can block seven overwhelm <laughs> yeah yeah so yes there's a good chance that we lose one of our guys maybe two of them but their their board would be decimated they're at a low health and so, yeah, I did exactly what John did and or said, and that's make a huge giant half their life. That was the other thing. The fact that that dark fire half their life total, Woo! it just puts the opponent in such a bad spot. So I think I don't exactly remember what they did. Probably uh, conceded when you yeah, probably when you played your cards and then. But yeah, yeah, I won't go into it. Long story short, I, I, I screenshot this because I think there were multiple lines. I think your line was completely fine as well, Sorbet. It's a little bit safer. Um, yeah, but, it's like 100% chance we win next turn, basically. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, so there's nothing wrong with it. And it's just a high risk, high reward thing. But it, like I said, it, in limited and with our hand, I, I just don't see them 
getting going down i think they ended up going down to three life or four life or something like that and we still had two units. we had the brawler and the flame keeper so it was just like or the patroller so it was like yeah all right um but yeah just something to look at sometimes that you sometimes even if you can't outright kill your opponent you can virtually kill them by putting them so behind on board uh, so yeah uh, just something to throw out there a little more of a straightforward one but i don't know if everyone would have caught that one or not i wanted to bring it up so but i'm glad the two draft powerhouses and the uh and the podcast picked up on that okay. i mean it's, it's hard to play a lot of this draft format and not get dark fired to the face at least once or whatever <laughs> yeah no joke right you always gotta keep that in mind or my opponent gets a uh, obliterate off their winvoke or they just flash fire i'm always paranoid about that i'm like great i'm gonna die right like i just feel it i'm like i feel like i'm about to get faced and sure enough in a turn or two boom i'm like oh great anywho all right that's going to do it for that section which leads us into our final constructed corner and this week having m sorbet being a constructed protege so it is or yeah prodigy and whatnot and obviously downplaying his limited Throughout the entire podcast, we're going to go ahead and let him shine a little bit and talk about an Elysian Expedition deck that he has been climbing with using, uh, once again, Draw. So let me break down the deck for you, and then you can take it away. Of note, it is 42,300 Shift Stone, not including campaign cards. Four Permafrost, four Transpose, three Dazzle, four Desert Alchemist, four Draw Ascending, three Lightning Storm, Four Petition, four Turn to Seed, four Wisdom of the Elders, three Forbidden Research, four Helio the Skywinder, three Solar Blast, three Souls Rest, so that's what you had me at, three Channel the Tempest, five Primal Sigil, four Cobalt Waystone, four Elysian Silex, four Primal Symbol, four Seed of Wisdom, and four Time Symbol, with a market consisting of a Circe's Choice, Reign of Frogs, Wasteland Broker, World Pyre, and Aid of the Huru. Without further ado, M. Sorbet, take it away. Yeah, so um, just kind of putting World Pyre as, as a finisher in control decks is something I, I was kind of trying to experiment um, before this adventure. Um, but I think the the new cards that that came out really push it over the edge, being um, Dazzle and Jeral. Uh, so like the the it, it's got a lot of the like classic control elements where you're just drawing cards, removing stuff, um, and just trying to win eventually. Um, and that's that's with the Wisdom of the Elder, uh, Turn to Seed, Lightning Storm, all that stuff. Um, and then uh, Jeral uh, makes it so much easier to to just end the game. Um, once you once you start to hit your influence and mana requirements, uh, it's got it's got the classic um, transpose into world pyre. Uh, the ways you really benefit are souls rest, solar blast, um, and channel the tempest in the main deck. Um, and then if if the game goes on really long, which sometimes it, it will, and you find another transpose, uh, you grab wasteland broker, broker in eight of the huru, and then just finish off by. Uh, casting those one after another yeah a small piece uh, of side tech that you did as well that i liked is that you don't necessarily need world pyre to cast eight of the huru because the deck can get generate quite a bit of power on its own but you can yes. also get the double justice influence off of forbidden research right yeah um i don't think there's going to be many scenarios where you're transposing and grabbing wasteland broker before you're getting a world pyre then apparently i'm playing um, the deck wrong <laughs> um, but but I think I think a lot of the the strength of this um, comes from um, the fact that I think I think a lot of the I, th I think a lot of the control cards are are positioned very well. Um, so you can just play this as as just a regular old control deck uh, without necessarily needing the world pyre to win. Um, I think I, I guess notable. Uh, numbers here is that three of Dazzle. Uh, Dazzle's really good, but I think uh, at least in Expedition, uh, four of can get clunky sometimes. Um, it still feels great to have it. Uh, and I like having the extra plunder effect uh, along with the four Alchemists to smooth out the curve pretty easily. Um, and then similarly, um, at the top end, I just put uh, Soul of Blast, Soul's Rest, and Channel the Tempest at three ofs uh, to avoid 
real, real terrible clunky hands. Um, and you can always mess with your clunky cards with either forbidden research, pitching them or uh, plundering them uh, as you need. Just out of curiosity, was there any temptation to put in either the touch of battle to give your lightning storm deadly or the the pri the horrible primal one no one plays to give your solar blast overwhelm to one shot your opponent um i had not i, had, I hadn't thought of that um they it you're I welcome could see, i could see um putting putting those in I, I think the touch of battle is probably the worst one of those just because um you don't really have units besides um Jural, uh, desert alchemist and helio and helio's really late game you're not going to be touch of battling that too much um, yeah, and desert Guardian alchemist already deadly. has deadly yeah <laughs> <laughs> so uh, probably not that one and the other one um interesting Again, gimmicky like unit in play i, th I think i think yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah prob probably not it's a little gimmicky it's kind of it's kind of fun um it, it it would definitely be a very fun way to win uh I mean, yeah, that's pretty much. John, I know you've played around this a similar archetype. Anything that uh, you want to add about it? Um, no, nothing in particular. I haven't, I haven't actually played this exact uh, deck yet. I know you posted a, a little bit ago, but I've been doing some yeah. other brewing and stuff. And I, like you just said, I've played a ton of decks like this, so mm -hmm. this one's kind of on the back burner for me to try out or whatever. But I'm looking forward to it. Um, I, I do love decks like this. I think it is, uh, it's, it's should be pretty strong in the meta. So. Yeah, it's it's been feeling pretty good. It's base it's bad matchups uh, like Skycrag um, or or any fire based aggro decks. Those are those are going to be the the toughest ones. Mm -hmm. um, if if the time if the time the big time decks have a really fast start um, where they just they just play really big dudes and you don't have a Desert Alchemist or a Permafrost, then it's tough. Um, but I feel like you you tend to win the the slower mid rangey creature decks matchups. Um, and then if if you're up against any any other slow deck, like you're just gonna win every time because you just outvalue them super hard. Yeah, fair enough. I've had some bad luck. There was one deck where I, one game where I was controlling the entire game, and it got to a point where they just drew better than me, and I drew yeah. card after card after card, and none of it was gas. It was all like spinning the wheel stuff. I was like, oh my god! Right. So I literally just lost to something silly i was just like ah, i hate my life right now but sometimes when you get to souls rest with the draws and play into a channel the tempest you just feel like oh, you're yeah. king of the world yeah, draw draw total all-star of this deck the the majority of it is spells um so like half the time you're you're drawing off of its effect and um you you can you can build up your uh influence pretty easily so even just having the two mana three five berserk is already it's already pretty decent yep total all-star nice well thanks for sharing it with us really do appreciate it of course you have if you have more questions you can catch the eternal war cry link to this deck on the show notes and uh you can join the discord that where you can talk to msor bay as well be like hey man i liked your deck or oh my god i hate you you're making my my eye <laughs> you know my ears bleed but uh check it um, out it if anyone has any questions or anything, I'm, I'm happy to help. Awesome. Uh, M. Sorbet, thank you so much for taking the time to coming on this show, dude. It was absolutely great having you. You've been a great addition to the team, helping us get better and brew and, and testing and all kinds of great and just being an all-around great guy. So thank you so much for being on the show, buddy. Yeah, no problem. It's a good time. Uh, I know I just said that people can find you at our Team Eternal Journey or Eternal Journey <laughs> Discord. Where else, is there anywhere else you uh, can be found at? um not, not really perfect excellent keep it exclusive that's right join the discord all right join us um great place to get tips on both limited and constructed and just all around if you have bad beats and want to share you can join us there and check it out it's a good time of course, once again, wanted to mention the YouTube channel where you can catch the video version of this podcast as well as all our various tutorials and whatnot on there and twitch.tv slash Jedi underscore EJ every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, where I stream live, mostly limited with at least one day of constructed. And that could be increasing based on what the viewer base likes. 
John, Alex, thank you guys so much for being on the show. As always, I really do appreciate you guys. I think today was a lot of fun. I'm excited to continue brewing with all the new cards in the campaign. I hope you all out there in listener podcast, real world land or whatnot are as well. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and that'll do it for this week. Until next time, as always, happy gaming. Bye. Good luck in your draft keys, everyone.